Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. Uh, but we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com and hit the contact us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. Well, at the end of, John, of Revelation chapter 10, excuse me, John was recommissioned to once again and go preach the gospel to all the nations. And I noted in our last study that the, the commission was not only for John, but it was for the church as well. The church has always had both the responsibility and the authority to take the message of the gospel to a dying world that desperately needs to hear the message of the gospel. And God has uniquely gifted each one of us to do so. For instance, to some, he has given the gift of public proclamation, such as preaching. To others, he has given the gift of evangelism, evangelism that may take place in private conversations or perhaps sometimes in, private, in public settings. To others, he's given the talent of writing, and through their unique skill, they can take the gospel message through the written word to those who need to hear it. The gifts of others may take other various forms, such as people skills, or some people who seemingly never meet a stranger and they can very quickly relate to them. I can't relate to that myself, but I'm glad that God has gifted some people in that way. And that is a legitimate gift that God has given to some, whereby they can be used to glorify God through the spreading of the gospel. And, I, and just before we get into the text this morning, can I give you a little assignment? Would you take some time in the coming, perhaps this afternoon or the coming days, and, and meditate on this question? Am I using my gifts to glorify God and spread the gospel, or am I trying to build my own kingdom with God's gifts? It's an important question. I pray that you would meditate on that. Again, have you considered how God has uniquely gifted you to take the gospel and tell the gospel to others? It's certainly something to think about, isn't it? Well, back to our text. The recommissioning of John at the close of chapter 10 leads us right into the vision of chapter 11. As we saw three weeks ago, the chapter opens with John measuring the temple. Now remember that the temple, we identified them as being the people of God. And the purpose of the measuring was to show who was in, who was a part of the kingdom, who were the true worshipers of God? That was the purpose of the measuring. John was also instructed to not measure the outer court because the outer court was given over to the nations. Now, when you read that in Revelation, you can understand that to be the unbelievers of the world. They are not God's people. Then finally, John is told that uh, they... The nations, the unbelievers, will trample the holy city for 42 months. So the 42 months is, is a reference to a particular period of time that we'll get into here in a moment. But the trampling refers to the persecuting of God's people. So we know from this vision that the church will be persecuted for a certain period of time, a definite period of time, but also a limited period of time. So what are we to make of the 42 months? Well, keep in mind that numbers in Revelation, primarily, 
uh, and many times are purely symbolic. So that would mean that the 42 months are not to be taken literally, but rather we should see them as a specific, limited period of time. It has a beginning and it has an end. It's 42 months. And by the way, we're at the point in our study of Revelation where these numbers are going to, we're going to see them uh, with greater frequency. So let's just talk about them here for just a moment. Uh, 42 months is three and a half years. 1,260 days is three and a half years. And a time, times, and half a time, anybody want to guess? It's three and a half years. So these numbers all refer to the same period of time. 42 months is 1,260 days. 1,260 days is a time, times, and half a time. A time, times, and half a time is what? Is three and a half years. Say, why are they expressed differently? Frankly, I don't know. I'm not sure why. Uh, There's different ways that they're used in the book, but here's what we do know. We do know that they all refer to the same specific period of time. Say, well, what is that time? Do we know what that time is? Yes, we do. This represents the period of time between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. Or we could say it represents the church age. We could also say it represents the day and age in which we are Living, So we are in the midst of the three and a half years. We are in the midst of the 1,260 days. We are in the midst of the 42 months. But this morning, our focus is going to be on the two witnesses. Now, you know, uh, as I said a couple weeks ago, those who try and interpret the book of Revelation literally, they would have us to believe that the temple was a physical structure. Well, we run into some problems if we try and interpret Revelation in a literalistic fashion because now all of a sudden we've got to identify these two witnesses. So let's look at this. And there's four things that I want us to look at as uh, that pertains to the witnesses. And the good news for you is I'm only going to cover three of them this morning. Amen. And we'll jump back on the fourth next week. Let me give you the three. Well, let me give me the four and you can create that create a great sense of anticipation for next week. Amen. First, we have the authority of the two witnesses. Second, we have the assignment of the two witnesses. Then we have the protection of the two witnesses. And then finally, which we will look at in greater detail next week, is the power of the two witnesses. So let's start with the, uh, the authority of the two witnesses. Look with me at verse 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So the first question that rightly arises in our minds is, who are they? Who are, what's the identity of these two witnesses? Now, as you can imagine, there have been literally thousands of pages written as to whom these two witnesses may be. And again, if we go back to our dispensational friends and they try and interpret Revelation in a very literal fashion, uh, they try and come up with two specific names of who these two witnesses could be. There's multitudes of uh, possibilities that are being floated by various commentators. I'll just give you a couple. Uh, Some would say, well, this is Moses and Elijah. And I can understand why they say that as we get a little bit farther into the text. Then others would say, no, it's not, it's not Moses and Elijah, but rather it's Enoch and Elijah. And I can understand why they would say that as well. Say, well, why would they say that? Because who were the two men in Scripture who never died? Enoch and Elijah. And so the theory goes that everybody has to die. So these old boys, uh, they've just been putting it off for a while, and they're going to come back, and they're finally going to get to come up. No, that's not the point here. Uh, So it's, it's a real problem if we try and identify them as two literal people. But what if we interpret the identities of the two witnesses in the same way that we have been interpreting the rest of the book? <coughs> Excuse me. What if we interpret the identities of these two witnesses in a symbolic fashion? I mean, that's what we've been doing throughout the book, and hopefully it has made sense to us as we've worked our way through the book. I say, no. 
why in this case would we identify them in some symbolic fashion? Well, let's read verse 4. I think verse 4 really clears it up for us. These, referring to the two witnesses, these are the two olive trees. Now, you're probably wondering, why did Ben take us to a book that we very rarely ever read from and read that for us this morning? Well, it has to do with what we're going to be seeing here. I don't have time this morning uh, in order to go into Zechariah chapter 4. Perhaps we'll do that a little bit more next week. But this is, this is where the, verse 4 is, is referencing is Zechariah chapter 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, so these two witnesses are identified as two lampstands or the two olive trees that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, where have we read about lampstands before? In Revelation, correct? In fact, if we go back to Revelation chapter 1, we have the opening vision of John and John sees the Lord Jesus standing in the midst of what? Seven golden lampstands. And what did we determine the lampstands to be? They represent, they symbolize the church. Revelation 1.20, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So if the church is identified as a lampstand in chapter 1, is it plausible to assume that the two lampstands in chapter 11 are a reference to the church? Well, I think we would have to admit that, yes, it's plausible, and I would say it's more than plausible. I would say that it is correct. So these two lampstands represent the church. The two witnesses represent the church. You say, well, why are there two of them? If you go back to Deuteronomy, what was one of the, one of the, the facets of the law? That nobody could be convicted on the word of a single testimony. There had to be two witnesses. So that's why we have the two witnesses here in Revelation chapter 11. Commentator Simon Keysmaker writes, I suggest a symbolic interpretation, namely that the two witnesses represent the church of Christ, that by proclaiming the gospel, by proclaiming the gospel calls the world to repentance. Now, what does it mean that these two lampstands, these two witnesses, stand before the Lord of the earth? Here's what it means. It means they are sent out by God, they are commissioned by God, and they are given authority by God. So, in a practical sense, that means that we, the church, we stand before the Lord of all the earth, and we are to take our marching orders from Him. No one else. This is very important. They took their marching orders from the Lord. We as a church, we take our marching orders from the Lord. So, and I'll come back to this in just a moment. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but let's move on. So we have the authority of the two witnesses. Next, we have the assignment of the two witnesses. Now look at verse 3 again, and we'll pay particular attention to the closing part of the verse. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. <laughs> and they will prophesy. Here's the assignment. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So what is the assignment of the witnesses? They are to prophesy. They are to preach the gospel to all the nations. And how long are they to do this? Well, symbolically, 1,260 days or throughout the duration of the church age. From the time Christ went back to heaven, from the time Christ came to earth, the time Christ uh, comes back to earth for the second time, we are to be busy preaching the gospel. We have no right to deviate from that. That is our assignment. That is what we are all about. The assignment of the church is to preach the gospel. And our authority to preach the gospel doesn't come from man. 
Our authority to preach the gospel doesn't come from the government. Our authority to preach the gospel doesn't come from a vote of the congregation. No, the authority to complete the assignment comes from the Lord of the church. Again, that means, by the way, because it's God's assignment carried out under God's authority, that means it will be successful. Okay? Don't ever doubt that the commission that Jesus Christ gave to the church will fail some way. It won't. It will be carried out successfully. So again, the church, therefore, has no right to deviate from the assignment that the Lord Jesus has given to us. The church, I want to hammer this home again, because so many churches have lost sight of this. The church has been given one assignment, and one assignment only. It is to preach the whole counsel of God. It is to preach the gospel. It is to evangelize the lost. That is our Role. That is our responsibility. That is our obligation. We have no right to deviate from that at all. And by the way, when I say preach the gospel, I mean preach the Bible. Preach the Bible. Preach the Bible. I don't, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit trail. But I saw a video of what a church did on Easter Sunday that was absolutely blasphemous. Why do churches feel they have the liberty to do things like that? Why, why, why do they think they, they, they have the right to do that? In my opinion, they're a church in name only. You know what it boils down to, beloved? They don't believe the Bible. They don't. They don't believe that the Scriptures are sufficient. So they think they've got to be somehow clever and put on this Hollywood production. But the church has one assignment, and we have the authority to carry out that assignment, and it is to preach the gospel. We are not a social agency. We are a gospel agency. We're not a political action committee. We are a gospel action committee. By the way, what is the attitude that we should have as we declare the whole counsel of God to a dying world? Well, notice that it says, they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. You won't see that in the latest department store fashions. It won't be hitting the runways of Paris this fall as the latest designer's new collection. You know what sackcloth represents? Mourning. Mourning. You go back to the Old Testament, you read many times of the Old Testament prophets and they're dressed in sackcloth or something horrible happens and they... Wear sackcloth. It's a sign of mourning. It's a sign of judgment, which means that as the church preaches the gospel, as you as an individual share the gospel, there's a sense of mourning for those who reject the gospel because we understand that when they reject the gospel and they die in their sins, they will forevermore experience the judgment of God. That's why there ought to be a seriousness when we come to church. I, I don't understand this attitude of this so-called happy, clappy worship. People are dying and going to hell. And we're entertaining ourselves with some half-baked church production. I think of... I have to be careful because I'm preaching two weeks and it kind of builds up and I want to explode. You know, I look at these things from a, 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 a position of the stewardship of God's resources. These churches spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars on these productions. Is that a good stewardship of God's money? Does that demonstrate that we really care for people? 
Uh-huh. So we have the authority of the two witnesses. Second, we have the assignment of the two witnesses. And third, <coughs> excuse me, we have the protection of the witnesses. Look at verse 5. If anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth. And all the fun men, let's get excited about that point. Ooh, yeah, baby. Uh, if anyone harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. So again, we have to ask ourselves, is this to be taken literally or symbolically? Well, hopefully by now the answer is obvious. We have to interpret this in a symbolic fashion. How are we to understand the fire that pours from their mouths? Well, as with the rest of the book of Revelation, we compare Scripture with Scripture. In this case, we compare Scripture with the Old Testament. Listen to what we read in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word. Now, this is God saying this to Jeremiah. I am making my words in your mouth of fire. And this people, the hearers, wood, and the fire, the word of God, shall consume them. Later, Jeremiah 23, 29, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. As Joel Beek says, Jeremiah didn't turn into a human flamethrower. What, what, what the meaning is here is that the word of God, spoken by Jeremiah, had a power like fire. Fire has an effect on anything that it touches, correct? In some cases, fire purifies. In some cases, fire destroys. So the point here is that God's Word has the power to convict the sinner of their sin. And God's Word also has the power to ultimately condemn the sinner if they reject Jesus Christ. And then God's Word is like a hammer that can break the hardest heart. See, we need... <laughs> God's Word is like a hammer to break the hardest heart. Not our productions. Not our clever talks. Not our homespun wisdom. No, it's, it's the Word of God. Therefore, what must be the major function of the church? To open our mouths, as it were, and to unleash the firepower of God's Word. And by the way, I don't have time to deal with this this morning, but the safety of the church is predicated upon our faithfulness to our assignments. It's no secret that not only in America but around the world, the mainline denominations are pretty much dead people walking. There's no power in them. I, I read a report or read an article on Easter Sunday that they estimated that 25% of the great Gothic cathedrals in Europe are now empty. There's no preaching there. There's no people there. Why? They gave up on the authority of God's Word. And when a church does that, they no longer have the protection of God. Why? Because they are in complete disobedience to their assignment. So what does it mean? What does the text mean when it says that if anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed? Here's what it means. It means that all who reject the gospel as it is proclaimed, as it is taught, as it is shared in many ways, their rejection, rejection will ultimately be their undoing. It will be their condemnation. They're bringing their own judgment upon themselves because they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Richard Phillips says the point is when the church witnesses boldly and faithfully, God's word has power over her enemies. And oh, I long for the day when churches here in America would just realize this and get back to this. 
We are so concerned about who's sitting on the Supreme Court. We're so concerned about who's controlling Congress. We're so concerned about who's controlling the White House. Why are we not concerned about what's controlling the pulpits of the churches in America? I grew up when the moral majority came to power. It did nothing. And yet today, churches continue in the same vein. They just don't have any confidence in the Word of God. Look at verse 6. They have the power to shut the sky. That's referring to the two witnesses. It's referring to the church, so let's pay close attention here, okay? They have the power <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to shut the sky. <coughs> I apologize. Okay? May fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now, again, the, the they, verse 6, refers to the two witnesses. So the, the church, the two witnesses, are described as having the power to stop the rain, power over the waters to turn them into blood, the power to strike the earth, and every kind of plague. Now, again, I hope you understand that this is not literal. This is not literal. But this, is, this, this paints such a, a beautiful picture and helps us understand a powerful truth here. Um, those words, those descriptions, probably sound familiar to us. And the reason they sound familiar to us is because they're describing actual events that took place in the Old Testament. Now, was there an Old Testament prophet who called down fire from heaven? Yes, Elijah. On two occasions, Elijah calls down fire on uh, a company of uh, 50 soldiers and a captain. He does this twice, and finally the third, third guy wised up and said, Hey, hang on. <coughs> but Elijah called down fire from heaven. Didn't Elijah also pray that there would be no rain in Israel for a period of time? Yes. And do you know how long the drought in Israel lasted? Three and a half years, 1,260 days, 42 months, a time, times, and half a time. But what about the waters being turned to blood? What about the plague striking the earth? What, who might that be a reference to? Well, that would, be, that would be Moses, right? Moses is referred to here in the... The plagues of Egypt say, well, why is Moses referred to here? Well, Richard Phillips is helpful. He says, Moses' plagues highlight the church's ability to liberate people from the bondage of sin through the proclamation of the gospel. What was Moses' ministry? <coughs> it was one of deliverance, correct? He was delivering God's people out of Egypt, out of the slavery and the bondage of Egypt. So the church like Elijah, like Moses, has the power of God at their disposal. Do you see what he's driving at here? Now, I want you to think seriously about this. Do you realize that the power that the prophets demonstrated is the same power available to the church today. That's the point. Not that we call fire down from heaven. Not that we pray for a drought. Not that we pray that waters turn to blood and plagues strike the earth. No, we pray for the power of God. Do you see that? That's the picture. Think about Elijah. He was a man's man now, I'm telling you. And we look at him, we think, wow, what a guy. He took on all those prophets of Baal. This guy was a, he was a biblical stud, man. I mean, this guy was something else. 
And we look at him and we think, well, that's Elijah. Uh, I'm not Elijah. We're not Elijah. Wrong. 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 We, the two witnesses, the church, have the same power available to us that Elijah had to him, that Moses had to him. Do you believe it, church? Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not, cannot, will not, ain't going to happen, will never prevail against it. Do you believe that? If you truly believe that, you won't be apathetic towards the church. How can you be? What does James say about Elijah? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now, that's comforting to me. We, we, we tend to put some of these folks on, on, on a pedestal in Scripture, and Jesus is the only one to be put on a pedestal. Elijah was just like us. He just lived in a different time in a different place, but he served the same God that you and I serve. Elijah was a man uh, with a nature like ours. And what did he do? Did he sit around and wish? Did he hope? Did he say, let's get a committee together and strategize this bad thing? No. Uh, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. See, we access the power of God through our prayers. Do you see why I want us to be a praying church? And John, I, I would ask you to do this, to incorporate during our prayer time the prayer for God's power. The day I feel like I can't enter the pulpit apart from God's power is the day I'm done. I'm out. Why? I have nothing to say. I can't convince you to go to lunch with me. But it is the Holy Spirit that works through his people that makes all the difference in the world. When we gather to pray, we are visibly demonstrating to God our weakness, our insufficiency, and our need of his help. When we gather as a church to pray, we show Jesus that we believe him, that when he said that, apart from me, you can do nothing. A prayerless church is a weak church. A prayerless church is an ineffective church. A prayerless Christian is a weak Christian. A prayerless Christian is an ineffective Christian. I'm almost done. Think about the great civilizations that have come and gone. Think about the empires that rose and then collapsed. Think about the great leaders, military or otherwise, who have uh, arrived on the stage of human history and how many of them saw defeat Then ask yourself this question, what is the one organization that has survived it all? The church. The church. And beloved, it will survive. There may be dark days ahead, but the church will survive. We have God's word on it. I close with this. I, I heard uh, a man use this illustration. He said it was from Sinclair Ferguson during World War II. Uh, a missionary was in London during the bombings, and he came across a, a little boy on the streets. And the little boy uh, was crying, was upset, and he was afraid. And the missionary grabbed his hand, and he said, Stick by, stick by me, because until my mission is finished, I'm invincible. And beloved, until our mission is finished, we're unvincible.